going to talk about economic desperation in America. And I'm going to start off by telling you this story. Years and years ago, I had a friend who wanted me to write some Craigslist ads for him because he knew what I was doing. So I wrote some ads for him. Now he was looking for, I guess, a sugar baby type arrangement before sugar baby stuff became mainstream. So I wrote to Matt looking for uh, what he was looking for. And you know, he got this girl to answer his ad. She was a single mother, two children by two different fathers. She lived in the hood, very attractive girl very attractive girl. So my friend entered into an arrangement with her. And then when he was telling me about it, you know, here's my friend. My friend was an IT professional. He was used to dealing with people in the IT world. And typically if you're an IT corporate person, most of your people that you work with gonna be well to do and he was like you know after a short period of time with this girl because he he would go over and he he just told me the things he would see he was like I was over a house one night and I saw a roach walk across my wallet and I was just like you in the hood man you in the hood roaches are normal parts of the hood and he he just you know, it, it became, you know, he, he was just telling me all of these things, like she had roaches and she said, she, she wasn't dirty. Her place was clean and neat, but she had roaches. I say, you know, um, roaches can happen to virtually anyone. It's just a matter of, do you have pest control? And based upon her economic circumstances, she didn't have money for pest control. So, he got into this arrangement with her and he just started to notice there was so many things that was wrong. And uh, he, he was telling me she now I know about this. I know a lot about this, that she had a flat tire. And the first thing he was like, why are you calling me? <laughs> you know, that was his first thing. And she needed money for a new tire. And when I had my rental car business, a flat tire was an economic crisis for many of the people. Shout out to James Anderson. He knows exactly what I'm talking about, that these people are financially desperate, economically fragile. And he began to, you know, even though she was very attractive, really nice body, he actually came out of that. He, he's like, I can't do this no more because it's like, she's cute, she's friendly, she's attractive, but everything else is a disaster. You know, it's like, I could not imagine taking her out on a date with my friends and then she comes to the table and a roach crawls out of her purse, which could happen. It could happen, you know, when you dealing with roaches. Um, and, you know, I remember this because this girl was economically desperate. Single mother. Essentially, she was a prostitute. You know, uh, that's what being a sugar baby is. I don't care how many YouTube videos and TikTok videos. It's like, oh, you're... You're just companionship. You just get paid for your time. You just... No, if you are a true sugar baby, you're going to be a prostitute. And um, one of the things that I see is a lot of economic desperation. And this was, all right, today is July 18th. Go ahead. 
and get into the intellectual property school today. I know most of you are waiting to the 31st and you're gonna pile in, but let me go ahead and talk to you. In this video, I talk about skill sets and what the intellectual property school is going to do is give you new marketable skill sets. You think video, the ability to produce, structure, and create videos is something that's gonna go away anytime soon? It's not. If you, let me go ahead and give, break it down to you. If you can learn how to edit videos, edit videos, not shoot videos, just edit videos with precision. That's a 50 to $100,000 a year job right there. Knowing how to edit videos, becoming very skilled in Adobe Premiere, becoming very skilled in Final Cut Pro. 50 to $100,000 job, just right there. Um, if I was to put together a resume of everything I did and was to go out looking for a job, because I just don't really spend a lot of time that, but just for, for fun, I would, could get the job of being a creative director. I can get the job of being a chief information officer. And these jobs pay 350 to 500,000 a year. That is what my 14 years on YouTube has given me the skill sets to do. So once again, there's so much I can teach you in the intellectual property school. I'm gonna teach you how to set up a YouTube channel for tax benefits. And I'm gonna teach you how to set up a YouTube channel to make money. And once again, YouTube money, which is money from the AdSense program, is nothing compared to the money that you can make selling the online course. You could have a YouTube channel with 10,000 subscribers and be making 100K a year strictly from selling your course. Easy, easy. And I'm gonna give you home economics. And there's some other stuff that's gonna be coming. So go ahead, it's gonna be in the first comment or it's gonna be in the description with the promo code. Go ahead and get into the intellectual property school. Go ahead, do it, do it today. Don't delay, don't waste any time. Go ahead and get into the intellectual property school right now. Before the pandemic, and this was before the global reset, and this was before the recession, there, there's a ton of economic desperation in America because, you know, I've said this before and I'm gonna say it again. If you have a money problem, you have a skill set problem. The skill set problem comes before the money problem. And once again, the big issue with America is, you know, I was reading this blog where it was talking about 98 million people could not properly construct a sentence. And I was like, what? And then once I delve into it and I started to understand because like learning to make money online is not rocket science. It's not super hard, but it does take a level of intelligence. It does take activity like Let's talk about Bad Barbie. And if you don't know who Bad Barbie is, years and years ago, she was on the Dr. Phil show. She was the catch me outside girl. She has a following of 16, almost 17 million subscribers on Instagram. And she went to OnlyFans and made 52 million because 2.5 million of her Instagram followers went over to her OnlyFans page. And a lot of people will look at uh, her name is Danielle something, but you know her name her her screen name is Bad Barbie, and there are many people that were seduced by that story. And let me break it down to you why there's so much economic desperation. People will look at her situation because it's true; she did make. $52 million on OnlyFans. It is a true story. And many people will look at her and go like, she's just like me. Uh, I don't even know if the girl graduated high school. I'm not even sure. Um, I'm quite sure she didn't go to college because she's only 18, 19. Don't know. But let's just go ahead and say this girl who did not graduate 
high school. Because that's what I'm kind of thinking didn't happen. I could be wrong. You know, put in the comments if I'm wrong. And they're seeing that this girl who did not graduate high school go ahead and enter OnlyFans and make $52 million. Now, let's talk about this. $52 million after taxes is about $30 million. So it's a lot of money. It is $52 million made in one year is the beginning of a generational fortune. This is so much money that properly invested, it can take care of the next 10 generations easily, easily. So people saw this and people got very, very excited because I have this expression. It's possible, but it's not likely. And before Bad Barbie went on OnlyFans, there was a multitude of girls on the internet talking about they weren't making that much money on OnlyFans. So here's the breakdown. Bad Barbie has docked the feel to think for that $52 million. That $52 million fortune didn't start with her Instagram account of her 16.5 million fans, followers. It started seven years ago when she appeared on the Dr. Phil show. That's when it all started. And if you are a girl who doesn't have her pedigree, her resume, so to speak, her resume is when she went on that Dr. Phil show, she became the talk of the nation. Everyone knew who she was. Just like when Donald Trump ran for president, Everyone knew who Donald Trump was before he even ran for president. To get that level of name brand recognition is very, very hard. Very, very hard. Michael, when I say Michael, you think I'm either talking about Michael Jackson or Michael Jordan. It is super hard to get that level of name brand recognition where virtually anyone you walk to in the street knows who you are what you've done, what your resume is. That is incredibly hard. And Bad Barbie got that. But once again, economically desperate people do not dive deep into subject matter. They look at, like once again, I had a bet that Bitcoin was gonna go below 20,000 and I had every hillbilly, shyster, huckster, so I'm like, hey, I want a piece of that action. But the problem is they didn't have $10,000. And this is how I wanted to do the bet. I put my 10,000 up, you put your 10,000 up, we put it in an escrow account with these terms. When Bitcoin goes under $20,000, I win the bet. And once we started structuring and scrutinizing the bet where they had to put $10,000 up, right now, they were not real interested in proceeding with this bet. You wanna know why? Because most of the folks thought of it as a quick lick. They thought that I was stupid enough to engage in a bunch of bets with a bunch of broke people who didn't even have $10,000. They thought that I, you know, cause I'm somewhat of an educated lame, you know, he's like, yeah, he'll, you know, he'll pay, he lose, he'll pay. This is what the S, the economically desperate people will do. It's called a quick lick. A quick lick is where you don't do much of nothing and you can get a whole bunch of money very fast. That's that quick lick. And looking at the economically desperate people, because I've been thinking, you know, I've, I've put up many videos like why people are poor and everything, but part of this is, and I'm gonna say it, and I may come across as an elitist, brain power. Many of the economically desperate are not that smart in the case of being homeless. I at one point in my life was homeless, but I didn't stay homeless forever. 
I was homeless, homeless. Let, let's like there's degrees of homeless. Let's say you have a friend who doesn't have their own apartment, but they just kind of couch surf and they have like 10 friends that let them rotate on their couches. So that's like three days here, three days here. So literally they have enough friends where they could stay three days before their friend gets sick and tired of them and move to the next couch. And then they just start repeating the process. This person is technically homeless, but this person isn't, hasn't, doesn't have any mental ills or mental disabilities, which allow them to remain connected to society and have friendships and have people help them. Because if you are long-term homeless, I'll tell you a story really quickly. There's usually going to be a substance abuse problem or a mental illness problem. There was a guy here on YouTube who was homeless and this white dude's like, you know, started talking to him and the guy seemed to be pretty smart. It's like, I'm going to teach you coding. So he taught this homeless person coding and gave this guy a laptop and the guy learned how to code and he started working on projects and the guy helped him get an apartment, helped him get an apartment. So the guy had a new profitable skill set, had an apartment, and this lasted about three months and this guy went back to being homeless because he was institutionalized in being homeless. He could not handle having an apartment. He's like, you know, when they did an interview, he's like, that was just too much responsibility to have an apartment. And, you know, once they dived into it and they realized this guy had some mental illness, it became clear. So one of the big reasons that we have, because you know, there, there's levels to this and we're going to talk about the bottom level at the moment. The bottom level is people who have mental illness, a lack of social intelligence, a lack of social skills. Those three things right there create a huge barrier to entry for a lot of people in mainstream society. So you have a bunch of people who do the no fault of their own. That, and this is why I'm saying th this is the bottom segment of society. Um, Peter Jordan, what's his name? Jordan Peterson talked about this, that like 15% of the population was intellectually deficient to be more than a custodial cleaner. And once again, I am not making fun of these people because these people had no choice in this. This isn't something that they chose. This is something that they were born with and it just happened to be how they came out to be. And I remember talking to one of these people. I was at a Waffle House and there was this guy next to me and we just struck up a conversation and I began to quickly notice that this guy's verbal ability was extremely low. And I began to, you know, and I looked at him and I just saw this vacant blank stare back at me that this guy really didn't understand what I was saying. And I wasn't using big words. We were just having a simple conversation and Back in the day, they had a term for these people. They used to call these people simpletons because once again, I'm not trying to make fun of these people. I'm just pretty much illustrating why these people are where they are. Fun fact, there is a couple in Puerto Rico that both he and the woman have Down syndrome, okay? But the woman, he's attractive and his girlfriend is very attractive, even though he has Down syndrome and she doesn't have Down syndrome. And once again, being attractive in our society carries a lot of cachet, a lot of cachet. And I will submit to you that the reason that these down, people with Down syndrome, they're both clinically diagnosed with Down syndrome, are doing so well is because she's hot. 
he, this, this is another thing. Once again, going back to the guy that was uh, dealing with the pretty single mama. Um, in our society, beauty carries a lot of weight. Handsome, being handsome carries a lot of weight. And I saw that these people, now my best take of this is there was a guy, um, I, I cannot think of his name. He writes on the internet. This guy is disabled. He's paralyzed. He's in a wheelchair. I think he has to speak with a speaking tube because I think he can move his hands a little bit. And he, you know, this guy has built a multi-million dollar business because his body is messed up, but his mind is perfectly fine. And he just said, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And he went to put together this internet business that was making him millions, even though he's paralyzed. And there's been numbers of cases of people who've been extremely intelligent. But uh, another case of this guy, he was blind. He became an attorney. He became a very good attorney, even though he was blind. So once again, to illustrate why there is the bottom 15%, and let's go ahead and add that up really, really quickly. Let's see. We've got 330 million people minus 15%. Okay, that's 50 million people. That's 50 million people at, you know, with the Jordan Peterson's estimates. Now this article that I was reading, put it at 98 million, which is like 30%. And I believe Jordan Peterson is correct. And I believe this article is correct because first of all, once again, we were talking about the folks who have mental illnesses, uh, birth defects, no fault of their own. This composes this bottom 15%, okay? Now, who does this other bottom 15% is composed of? What do we see every time we turn around? Another person that got caught up in the PPP EDL loan scandal. This other 15% have no morals, none whatsoever. And I, I'm going to really dive deep into that. The number of people who are going to jail for PP, like essentially a lot of people figured out very, very quickly that there was not a lot of vetting going on. And you've got people, they put the PP cause uh, it was billions of dollars on the table. And the, the PPP loan fraud was something like, $500 billion. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people who knowingly, and I remember I was, I had a business bank account at PNC at the time. And I remember going in and talking to my banker and she said, we sure have a whole bunch of people coming in, signing up for business banking accounts. And you know, she's like, we're literally every day we have 10, 15 people coming in here to sign up for business banking accounts so that they can create these fraudulent PPP loan documents. Because it, it, it wasn't just black folks, even though this is what you consistently see in the YouTube world with the fraud, it was a bunch of white folks as well. And these people have no morals, no morals at all. And I'm gonna talk to you why morality is important. Years and years ago, I committed some white collar crime. And from a, I, you know, I was raised up, I was raised correctly. I was raised with a moral structure. I was raised with a church background. So I actively knew what I was doing was wrong. I knew clear, there was no, there was a clear line. It was wrong. And I did it and I felt really, really bad because I had a conscience installed in me growing up. This is very, very important. 
So I did it once, then I returned the money and I never did it again. Now, when you remove morality and consciousness from people, it's open season. This is why I believe the 98% number, uh, well, 98 million people are in this group because we have one group do the no fault of their own. They are just mentally deficient. And then we have another group. These people have no morals, none, none whatsoever. And this is why porn, porn has no problem getting beautiful women to come do sexual acts on camera. They're literally lined up. And one of the things that is starting to happen with porn industry, because we have this social media feedback loop, people are going out, they're doing porn, and then they're getting feedback from a social perspective that has entered into their personal lives. Uh, Brie Olson, she used to be one of Charlie um, Sheen's tricks. She was a porn star and she did several movies. She made like $5 million. And then the social backlash has made her feel so bad because once again, when she did it, she had no morals. And I'm going to say she probably still doesn't have any morals, but because the social backlash has been so bad, I mean, it's just been really, really bad because once again, in the case of Superhead, Kareem Steffens, who actually did a porn movie with Mr. Marcus, once you do that, there is no coming back. You will be ever forever tainted by that. Uh, it was one girl, Tracy Lords, and she stopped doing porn and she got into regular movies and she got a, quite a few regular movie roles. And, you know, because it was so long ago, a lot of folks don't know who she is unless you've just been around a long time. But what you will see with the women who would do porn, OnlyFans, Chatterbait, um, it's a lack of morals. It's a lack of morals because I was having a conversation with my girlfriend and she said, there's no way in hell that she could be a stripper. There was no way in hell that she could be a sugar baby. She just could not do it. So you have a large contingency of society that has a moral compass. But when you look at the bottom one third, let's just go ahead and call it one third of society, it's a mental deficiency component and a lack of morality. Now, here's where the morality comes into it. And we're about to talk about the MIG toe and red pill people. You have a lot of conversations that talk of, you know, that are in agreement with red pill and MIG toe men. A lot of these guys have no morality. Let me say this again. A lot of these guys have no morality. Remember I did the video, those who cannot trust cannot be trusted. Those who cannot trust, and I'm going to explain to you how that happened. Many folks due to no fault of their own were not brought up in a proper home. They did not have a loving mother. They did not have a loving father. They had no one to look after them. And these people grew up pretty much without a moral compass. And I was watching this show the other night and it was just deeply, deeply disturbing. This guy who had no moral compass married this woman. And then the woman, you know, back in the day used to go to jail for writing bad checks. She wrote some bad checks. She went to jail for 30 days and he just took her kids. And because they were legally married, the police didn't do anything because they were legally married. Like the laws have dramatically changed. Like if you were married to someone and you make off with one of your kid, Amber alert, everyone's phones going off. It's crazy. But this man took her daughter 
molested her daughter, got her daughter pregnant, and he did this for years and he went to jail because they convicted him on killing his son that he got her pregnant with. And she was 20 years old. She was pregnant three times and then she was supportingly killed in the automobile accident. They think it was him. And this man has no moral compass whatsoever. None whatsoever. And this is what happens when you have people with no moral compass engaging and in interacting with people of good moral character. So because you have so many people who from a mental level don't really know any better, they actually don't, and then you have a group of people who have no moral compass, this is why porn has no problem getting people. This is why um, Chatterbait, if you don't know what Chatterbait is, it's a camming site where women, transsexuals, and couples will perform. And here's the thing, I, I, I've done some research. When I watch Chatterbait, you know what I look for? I look at the background. And the majority of these folks are economically disastrous. They're economically desperate. I mean, cheap bedroom furniture. You rarely ever see. Now there are some of these girls who make a lot of money and as they make the money, they invest it in their set and it's totally different. But there's so many couples, there are so many girls on there that are clearly broke, clearly broke. And the only reason they're doing this is to get some money. And let's go ahead and talk about me because you know, uh, there, there's been much been said about me. And one of the reasons that I have made so much money is I have morals, I have character. And I know that's, that's going to sound surprising to some, to some of you, to the nerd tribe, you get it. But to the people who are deficient on brain power, because I have, other than the white collar crime stuff, I've not done anything illegal. I've never broken the law other than maybe speeding. And because I have this moral compass, because like right now, I am selling you a product called the Intellectual Property School. And what I tell you up front is you're looking at a three year journey. I do not say that you're going to make money instantly and you're going to quit your job. I set the stage because um, I've gotten comments. It's like, is this one of the reasons that you've been able to sell online courses for so long? Because you tell the truth. Because here, here's the thing. If you know up front what's coming, it makes it easier to deal with versus me lying to you. Um, there's someone else who's in the space who sells, uh, she sells a course that teaches exactly what I do. And she isn't lying, but she doesn't emphasize the learning curve. Um, you could get someone like, this is why I say when I teach you guys six months to a year, because if you just don't hit it, you don't nail your audience correctly, it's just going to take a lot of trial and error for you to actually flesh out what you want to do to grow your business. But because I have morals and ethics, this is why people on the internet trust me because I do not sit out here and just make up stuff. And also to many people's dismay, when uh, what happened in October, because I didn't build my brand on being a boy scout, that, that's very, very important. I didn't build my brand on being a Boy Scout. It did nothing to my brand. And for a lot of people, they were shocked. They were like, this guy's still on the internet? This guy's still making money? Once again, the nerd tribe, the intellectual folks, these people actually understand. But for the casual observer who just saw a snapshot of me, they had no clue because like I said, 
I didn't build my brand on being a boy scout or, you know, I built my brand on being a dominant man. I was upfront and honest about that. Talked about it in several videos before the Anton Daniels bitch ass incident because that's what really started the whole thing. And I think Anton Daniels did that shit because he's jealous because I don't think he's a real millionaire. I don't really think so. And I am. And he got offended and he just did that. And then this launched this whole litany of internet stuff. And fortunately for me, I've been through it before. One of the things you will learn once you start becoming successful, you will have haters and you will have distractors. That wasn't the first time that's happened to me. And it, it, it got real interesting because a lot of people thought that I was going to be taking out or that was going to be forever my legacy. It's not. Because once again, the thing that saved me is I don't come here on the internet and lie to you. Now I have folks who's like, oh, this, this, this stupid black folks term, capping. That capping, oh, he's capping about this. But once again, I was under extreme scrutiny. And what came out of this extreme scrutiny? What came out of the extreme scrutiny? Nothing. I had literally everyone, well, not everyone, uh, the worthless people on my ass looking for stuff and they couldn't find nothing. Because there's nothing to find. And th this is one of the things, this is another reason that I was able, quote, to survive, was after this deep dive into my life, they couldn't find anything. No victims came forward, nothing. And it's just like, hmm, there ain't really nothing to see here. And this is another reason that I'm gonna add another group of people to the economically desperate. The people who cannot analyze and digest knowledge and come up with a correct assumption. This is another reason that people are economically desperate because these folks, because once again, what did I say earlier in the video? If you have a money problem, you have a skill set problem because you do not have the skill sets to make the money that you want to make so you can live the life that you want to live. And a big, big part of that is not having the intellectual brain power because I'm going to say it, nerds run the world. Nerds run the world. Putin, even though he's an evil nerd, Putin is a nerd. Everyone that is in power in running stuff is a nerd. And one of the things that happens is these people, because like we got the, the bottom 15% intellectually deficient for no reason of their own. We have another 15% no morals, none whatsoever. No moral compass, no character, no upbringing. I feel extremely blessed to be brought up by um, my grandmother. My grandmother was my stay-at-home mother. I never went to daycare, ever. I had an extreme amount of stability as a kid. Lived in the same house I was born in until I'd left to join the military. Extreme stability. And back when I was a kid, things didn't change as fast as they do today. So things were the same year after year after year after year after year. And for me, from a social, economic, personal development standpoint, that was extremely important to the foundation that I built that allowed me to be who I am. Because one of the things that you have to look at with the economic desperation, there's a few people who can slip through the cracks. I am one of the people who slipped through the cracks because from a social economic foundational standpoint, being born to a single mother, in Adamsville, Alabama, I'm not supposed to 
be where I'm at. I'm not supposed to be doing the things that I'm doing, right? I'm going to tell you why I was able to escape economic desperation. Education. 100% it was education. I did go to college, but more importantly, I did not stop learning. I, I am 55 years of age and I still study stuff. I still study things like one of my little projects I was working on and there's going to be a video on the clump, the corporate game. This is just something that I was intellectually curious about and it got me a $30,000 intellectually curiosity. Cause I'm still like to find things. I still like research. I like looking at numbers. So at the age of 55, I am still in learning and acquisition of knowledge mode. And that has made all of the difference in my success because you have, I remember what was his name? I think he played for Villanova and this guy just came out and openly said, I don't read. He was proud of the fact that he don't read. We have a nation of people who don't read, who don't self-educate, who do not pursue the knowledge. They pursue pleasure. They pursue fun. They, they, they like to hang out, but they don't do anything of that's gainfully important in life. And what's going to happen because we have an environment of that's producing more of these people. Number one, the number of kids who are being brought up in a stable home is dwindling. That is key. That's what happened to me. I was brought up in a stable home. Things did not change. And I was brought up in a neighborhood collective, which is something like Adamsville was here and Graysville was here. I can get on my bike and leave Adamsville and go to Graysville, which was like about two, three miles away. And people knew who I was. They knew who my people were and they had phone numbers because they knew how to contact these people. That type of community doesn't exist in many parts. In some smaller rural areas, you still have that. But at one point, this was all of America. It was simply all of America. And right now, because you don't have that, once again, going back to the family. And I get a lot of people, because right now I have a course called Glendon's Voodoo. It's pretty interesting. It's uh, in Disruptive Mail. And one of the things that you have to understand is you have to build families, not just families, like you have a man, a woman, and two kids, that's a family. You have to build strong families. You have to, once again, I want you to go back. If you're in the age of 35 to about 55, I want you to go back in your collective memory and remember going to your aunt and uncle's house and looking at those pictures from a social standpoint, everyone is trying to bag the baddest bitch, right? It didn't used to be that way. You had good, solid men marrying good, solid women in this hell society together. Right now, we're in a free fall. We're in a free fall. And once again, I have recently had to check my behavior because this recently, <laughs> this recently happened. Uh, you ever get confirmation that you made the right decision? You get confirmation we make the wrong decision because um, my ex texted me and my new girlfriend did not like that. And once again, I'm like, I live alone. I don't really hide nothing. 
So apparently she got in my phone, got my ex's number and sent her a message. And I was laughing my ass off because I am done with my ex. I don't really care anything about her. So the fact that my new girlfriend would light into her, cause you know, uh, we're, let's have this conversation, gentlemen. All women are crazy. It's just a matter of fact. But does her crazy mesh well? Because I know what I got. I know what I have on my hands. And you know, it's like, when I saw the message, you know the first thing that came to my mind? This girl really loved me. That's the first thing that came to mind. This girl really loves me. She really loves me. I wasn't angry or upset because like I said, I'm finished with the other chick. I'm just done. I'm like, what happens to her is what happens to her. But I just got confirmation because I, this whole weekend I was thinking, because for the first weekend, I literally took this whole weekend off. And that's the first time I've done this. I mean, like off, off. I didn't even come in this office and check my computer, not one time. I literally took off and I really enjoyed myself. And in the future, I'm gonna to continue to do that. So what's gonna happen is all training and stuff is gonna happen Monday through Friday. And I'm gonna start taking week up, weekends off and enjoy my girlfriend. Yep, true story. But one of the things that you have to understand is you've got to get skill sets to keep yourself from being economically desperate because this is one of the reasons that you know because now that i understand what i see people do i understand why like you're a single mother you have no prospects the government comes out with all this free money all you're thinking about is today I got this money, I'm, my bank account's fat, I can go get my nails done, hair did, everything did, and I can roll out and we can go to Chuck E. Cheese's. You're not even thinking about tomorrow. You're not even thinking about the police. Shaniqua Jenkins, it's FBI. You're not even thinking about handcuffs because you're living in the moment, which is another, um, byproduct of being economically desperate because you know when I sit back and I talk about you know having a 10-year plan a 15-year plan a 20-year plan speaking to the nerd gang the economically desperate they don't even hear me because they're living for the day they're living for that PPP loan money living for that stake living for those trips looking living for that BBL yes the, the, the accounts of what these people did with this government money, cosmetic surgery, dental work, all the things that they couldn't do when they were economically thirsty. Don't be economically thirsty, man. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's just um, really, really, it's not the way to go, man. It's just not the way to go. All right, today is July 18th. Go ahead and get into the intellectual property school today. I know most of you are waiting to the 31st and you're gonna pile in, but let me go ahead and talk to you. In this video, I talk about skill sets and what the intellectual property school is going to do is give you new marketable skill sets. You think video, the ability to produce, structure, and create videos is something that's gonna go away anytime soon? It's not. If you, let me go ahead and give, break it down to you. If you can learn how to edit videos, edit videos, not shoot videos, just edit videos with precision, that's a Fifty to hundred thousand dollar a year job right there, knowing how to edit videos, becoming very skilled in Adobe Premiere, becoming very skilled in Final Cut Pro. Fifty to hundred thousand dollar job, just right there. Um, if I was to put together a resume of everything I did 
and was to go out looking for a job because I just don't really spend a lot of time that, but just for, for fun, I could get the job of being a creative director. I can get the job of being a chief information officer. And these jobs pay 350 to 500,000 a year. That is what my 14 years on YouTube has given me the skill sets to do. So once again, there's so much I can teach you in the intellectual property school. I'm going to teach you how to set up a YouTube channel for tax benefits. And I'm going to teach you how to set up a YouTube channel to make money. And once again, YouTube money, which is money from the AdSense program, is nothing compared to the money that you can make selling the online course. You could have a YouTube channel with 10,000 subscribers and be making 100K a year strictly from selling your course. Easy, easy. And I'm gonna give you home economics and there's some other stuff that's gonna be coming. So go ahead, it's gonna be in the first comment or it's gonna be in the description with the promo code. Go ahead and get into the intellectual property school. Go ahead, do it, do it today. Don't delay, don't waste any time. Go ahead and get into the intellectual property school right now.